So I'm just showing a, a bit of services that are running on here. You'll notice initially that they're actually not the same. Um, you have a small larger set of services on the device on the uh, right there. That's a 6812. The other one is a 7816. It's mirrored. Okay. Um, so yep, this, uh, this device right here happens to be the 7816. We we'll use Metaswitch as our BGP stack. We don't feel that we need to go and write and reinvent the wheel when it comes to protocol. So we took one that was already existing and well known. Um, and that's what we use as our, as our BGP protocol stack today. And then you see a bunch of other services run, running on there. Everything from you know, FluentD, FilterD, you know, Influx, not your case on there, uh, Metaswitch, LDP. You can see the mixture of services on there that are, that are particularly running. And each one of those are a particular you know, Kubernetes controller that's interacting with the device. So we'll leave that right there for now. Adam, sorry. So what we're seeing here is the pods running on a single network device. Correct. So if you go and let's say just do a, a watch, I'm just doing a kubectl watch on this or just actually using a uh, bash watch. Let's not get them confused. To just basically have it every second to run the kubectl get pods command and you can see what pods are particularly running on there. And there's a whole lot of data you can get on there if you, if you really wanted to get more information. So let's say if you wanted to look at uh, and a switch dash BGP and we do dash o yaml. So you can put it in yaml or out in um, JSON, you get all sorts of data about what actually this heritage of this container was. This one actually was created by Tiller uh, and installed in that particular way. The service is ready. So we have a service status that you could look in if you wanted to curious on what the status of that service is. You know, the image pull policy, the image we're particularly running on this device at the moment. Um, yeah, and just a whole lot of data that is, you know, important to you. Everything from, you know, memory utilization that we will limit it to, to, you know, for each particular pod. So you can actually specify a container. Hey, you could only use X number of memory. If you use more than this memory, bad, bad, we'll restart you. Um, and there's a bunch of other items like that. And there's a, this, you can set all those particular policies in there, and you can see a restart count when it started, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't need to go into those. I guess you could do it from another host as long as you point the, um, the API and point to the right device. Well, on, in this particular case, I'm actually not on the device. Yep. I'm actually remote. So uh -huh. I'm on a different Linux device uh, right here. So just, you know, some other IF Linux, you name. I think it's a Ubuntu device. Yeah, Linux device is sitting on there turning Ubuntu. And I'm actually remotely so grabbing those commands. Config, you have the uh, mm -hmm. API endpoint set as the... Correct. Right. Yeah, so you can go ahead and pull all sorts of interesting stuff. Uh, I'm going to start with just showing the CRDs. So if you do get CRD in here, you get a list of all the CRDs that we've actually registered with the system. And these are all the custom resource definitions that we've configured and set up and installed that uh, we utilize to interact and plan with the device. Cool thing about this, let's see if you were, you know, Mr. Network Programmer and you want to get more details about a particular CRD. Um, again, I'll just take BGP for an example. Let's look at BGP Global and look at config. Kube CTL. Get uh, describe. Let's see if I can read. CRD. Pop it in there. And now you get all the detail of how that actually, that, that uh, particular object is structured. So you can get all the details you want to know and all the goodness about how each particular item on there and what, um, you know, either enum or type it is, whether it's Boolean or, or what have you. So if I was sitting there trying to program against something to actually function with that API, it's self-describing. So you don't have to sit there and pile through documentation that you may not know or want to go through. You can actually just look at it on directly. So it makes it easier from that, that perspective. Um, is there all. any limitation on kind of what um, containers you can run in here or can you run applications or other services? Um, maybe for end users to kind of hit or troubleshooting tools or? You absolutely can. The limitation you're going to hit is going to be either in disk, CPU, or memory. Okay. At the end of the day, these are switches. They have, you know, more CPU than you would for a traditional, you know, OEM lockdown device in many cases. Um, I mean, they'll have, in, in some instances, 16 gigs of RAM and a four-core CPU. Sometimes it's Atom, sometimes it's Xeon. And you can, you know, mix and match those to some extent. So with that in mind, those are the only limitations you have. We're seeing a trend, though, with uh, like our friends at EdgeCore, where they're adding more and more CPU based on customer demand yep. and memory and disk. Better disk. People want to you know, put one of these in a location, like a remote location, mm -hmm. and use it as a Kickstart server. Correct. Um, and, and that's really common, because they're, they're able to collapse you know, four, five, six servers down into one top of rack switch yep. that happens to be providing the network connectivity as well. So think of it logically, if you're in a colo, 
very expensive space to go ahead and, and actually utilize. If I can now go ahead and load my kick service on that particular device as the first device gets up, I don't have to sit there and maybe use Salt or Puppet or something else to get even the initial servers initiated. And those servers, once they're initiated, then they can kick other servers. Yeah. I can now use the switch to go ahead and, and have it uh, load those particular items and it makes it come up much faster than you would normally. Right? So, uh, huge advantage from that standpoint from uh, my perspective for getting that particular site online faster. Yeah. Um, now you guys have mentioned Edge Core a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yep. Is this supported across you know pretty much any ONI enabled switch? I mean, it's because you're using the the open hardware abstraction Correct. layer, right? So like, the, what's the what's the scope of devices you can load this on? So so right now we're we're on uh, you know a bunch of different Edge Core devices that run you know 10, 40, 100 gig across several of the chip families. Um, it's really the the limit is is our barrier and our bar of quality for making sure the integration is solid. Yeah. You know, sure, we could go pull some own LP drivers and get the thing to boot and put it out there and get it running pretty quickly. But we put it through some rigorous testing in our lab and with some of our partners to make sure that this, this thing is rock solid. So um, yeah, we, we can run on pretty much anything that's own UIs and anything that has drivers out there, but we really like limit it down. This. And it's yeah. all right. I mean, the, the paint's still wet. I appreciate that, right? Yeah, like, sure. Yeah. It is, it is, we're, we're not going to sit here and tell you we're going to run on everything under the sun. I mean, that takes yeah. a significant effort to certify time. it yeah. and make sure it functions the way we want it to and the, the bar that we have for quality standpoint. But yeah, we're, I mean, just like anybody, uh, any, any other startup, we're customer driven, right? So the right customer comes along and says, I want to run on this. Guess what? We'll run on that, right? Uh, so, the joy of economics. Yeah. Sure. So <laughs> it's just a matter of, uh, you know, R&D time and bake time in the lab. Is that readable? Okay. <laughs> that's fine. That's, that was a quick note. That's, there wasn't a whole lot of discussion. That's why I asked, because I'm sitting there going like, you know, how about that? Is that a little bit better? Maybe? Go, just a little. Okay. Just making sure that you guys can see this. Uh, it's going to mess up a little bit of the formatting, I think. But let me make sure I can get this passed across here. I might have to make these a little bit bigger uh, as needed. Not you get the gist of it, though. I mean, yep. as long as you yeah. can see best, you need to make it a little bit bigger so you can see the, word, uh, yeah, yeah. the true, false on best. We could do that. We can that's make it a little bit easier just to kind of see. Just give me a second. This is how we prove it's live. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. We've all done this before. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I tried the best to get it up to the 1080p formatting that, that was here. Yeah. But I mean, I'm human, unfortunately. I'm not perfect. <laughs> not sure he's a robot. Yeah. <laughs> Touch bigger here, so you just kind of take a look at them. All right. So as I was telling you before, these are just, uh, and I'll show you what that looks like f actually first, and then we'll kind of go through here with that. Okay. All right. So basically, you can see items where I'm looking at one particular NLRI. This is just a loopback I'm advertising from one particular device, receiving on the other one, giving you the AS path, the you know, the basically just not all the parameters that are in the NLRI, but just some of them. I mean, otherwise we'd be buried in data. Um, but you can see one of the things that you know I'm going to notice in here is that you know this guy has to be Beth Pass being true. Uh, in this particular case, it's, it seems to hop around which one gets picked because of the age of the route, how long it's actually in the system. That seems to be the tiebreaker in this particular case in the setup, which is fine. Um, and that's the one that will get advertised to appear for that particular prefix, and then they'll figure out how to do their ECMP routing from that particular perspective. What are we actually looking at here? So where is this being delivered? Yeah. So right now, if you look at this, this is from the 7816. Uh, that we show that topology. I'm pulling this particular data from that device, as well as the BGP peer status, number of prefixes that we're, so we're sending, a small number of routes right now, and then just the NLRI data for that particular prefix, the 2220. The Grafana dashboard. dashboard. Yeah, yeah, Grafana dashboard. Oh, yeah. sorry. So from the switch itself? Uh, this is running externally. Externally. So we're using that, that functionality just explained with watch and using telemetry uh, D and snap telemetry D yep. uh, on the system. And they're basically bundling it up and sending it out using an Influx plugin okay. that we have that's basically put in Influx. You could also do it with Prometheus. I personally like Influx because I can do strings, I can do data, I can do all sorts of stuff like sure. that, not really limited. So um, that's just my, my perspective. But uh, Prometheus is a, you know, something that's really getting a whole lot of headway these days. Okay, so if we look at this right here, and might as well just do it on the The box. subtle point to that is that we've written the, the plug-in infrastructure to the point where it doesn't matter if you're running Prometheus or you're running, you know, Influx. It doesn't, it, it, you just use the Snap framework, and we, we actually right. ported the Snap framework to Kubernetes, um, which is something that didn't exist in the, in the world yet. So we're pretty proud of 
what we've been able to accomplish from that perspective. So this is the, the version of this, in, and, I'll, and I'll show it in CLI as well, but this is basically the idea of I have these, you know, the source names for these particular prefixes, the state uh, it's coming from, so it's state.stopper.com, is the, is the group that it's pulling from internally, the particular shims that I'm grabbing data from, um, and just the, the object I have to be pulling from. I'm actually pulling from individual and RIs in this case, that's how we have our structure set up. Um, you also can see this via the, the CLI if you wanted to. And you can get that data out there for what it actually looks like for each one of those items. If that's the, the method, you prefer to actually see it. So CLI, just like you would expect to see from a traditional vendor, like I was saying before, look and feel, show, you know, show pipe uh, and all that stuff like that. So you can do a short and config, dump out the entire CLI as you want, or you can do it in specific, like, you know, hey, I just want to look at the BGP config or even just, let's say, global or peers or whatever restriction you want from that particular perspective. So, so as you're, as you're, you know, if you were, if you were interfacing this with mm -hmm. CLI, yep. do the back end containers get spun up based off of what you config? Is that how that works, or do you have to like enable features and then, and then go in and configure them? So, so if you have a BGP daemon running in the background, or yep. you know, a container running for your yep. BGP, whatever, you know, can I go in and configure it here, and that kicks it off, or do I have to do something else to make sure the BGP is running, and then I go configure? So there's it. two ways of doing it. We can bundle it for you and hand it to you, and then you can remove services as you want, mm -hmm. uh, or you can come with a, you know, a base. Linux that we have, we give you, and then you can use Helm or something like that to deploy those particular pods on there. Okay. So what we do in you know internally, and we recommend customers to do this just in general, uh, even though they can consume it with all all the containers on there, is that you should have something, whether it be a hub that you know Docker Hub or your own internal Harbor instance. Mm -hmm. um, Basically, Harbor is something that you can store your stuff on there, and it will do security vulnerability testing on those particular containers, and then you can load them on as you need from that particular perspective. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I will show at one point actually removing. The containers from there. We'll I just, I just think that, you know, the CLI is going to be fully featured, right? I'm yep. assuming, like, even if, the, even if those things aren't enabled on the back end, yep. you're not going to like make CLI commands appear and disappear no, no. dynamically, right? So well, no, we do. We make could a, do that. You, yeah, absolutely. We do. So we actually, again, we leverage the, the watch functionality, and it's, we have a container called Prism, and that basically watches those CRDs as a CRD comes and leaves. We go ahead and consume it, put it into a, a Yang structure, and have it ingested by the CLI. Fascinating. Yeah. So, yeah it, so the other cool thing about it too is if you're if you're you know one of our customers, you can actually take things and control it with Kubernetes using the CLI that has nothing to do with our stuff or anything to do with the network. All you have to do is pu is publish the CRD the way that we describe, and you can add CLI commands on the fly. So there you go for the logs which actually is registering kind of cool. those particular. It, it's items. very cool because the, right, <laughs> when you look at this, right? I mean, like it, I'm sure you guys are completely aware of this, right? The challenges are coming from the networking space. Yep. We aren't touching this stuff regularly. Nope. We know what's coming, or getting our hands on it. But the majority of people watching this yep. are not running Kubernetes at any type of regular scale. Nope. So like this is intimidating, right? Like sure. you're, yeah. you're looking at this and saying, okay, I see all the value. There's going to be a transition path from the yep. time that I say, hey, I want to go down this to the point where I know what I'm doing. Um, and so, like being able to do that, where you know things become, you know, yeah. that, that path become because people are going to consume that CLI first. Absolutely, right? Absolutely, and we're, <laughs> and we're seeing that where people are like, "Hey, give me the CLI, and then I'll figure out all this other stuff as I get right. more comfortable with the system." And that's the whole point, yep. right? I don't see a long-term, you know, goal for the CLI. Do I ever see it going away? I don't. Do I see it being the long-term interface where people utilize for their system? I don't. That's not where the real power is. No. Yeah. So, but it is for some folks. I mean. This is, we keep harping on this, like, built for operators, for operators, like, this whole thing, but it's real, right? Like, we get woken up at 3 in the morning, the, the link is down. Okay, why? Because somebody decided that we weren't noticing links going down, so every link down is now a P1, right, in the entire data center. So somebody does something and a link goes down, but it's a redundant link, there's seven other links and it's fine. So, so if you can give the knock a way to look at everything, right, give them a CLI that's super structured and be like, hey, is everything up? Okay, everything's up. Okay, fine. I'm not going to page out the on-call engineer, right? And, and, and we've all been on that receiving end of the call where you're, you're driving. You don't even have a, a computer in front of you, and you're trying to call it. What do you see? Okay, run this command. What do you see? Run this command. What do you see? <laughs> and, and you're literally like nearly closing your eyes as you're on the road as someone's trying to describe to you what they're seeing in front of them. Very safe. As opposed to, <laughs> as opposed to, hey, run this command that I know is there because I put it there. Yeah. And give me this data. Yeah. That's the power of being able to do this. Go ahead. So from a management basis, I mean, uh, you know, Kubernetes is this whole set of disaster around pod management. And, yep. And everything else. What are you guys doing in terms of scale up? Because obviously, in larger data centers, yep. 
pod control and management? And are this, is it Helm is, as, as a distribution standpoint? How do you determine which sure. devices sure. you're actually updating? Like, I'm a big fan of Helm. Uh, but uh, what we're doing today, and, and I'll answer this in twofold. I'm, big, big, I'm a big fan of Helm. I like the idea of creating a Helm chart to describe what I want to deploy and how to deploy it. I can even do that with config, with the right chart, so I can have an easy mechanism to roll back and roll forward with a config I'm deploying on there. But for longer term from our vision is we're actually going to have a hybrid mechanism to control the device. So right now we're running Kubernetes directly on the, on the switch, right? Sitting on there, Kube API, Kubelet sitting on there. We're going to run, and we have in some instances, a secondary Kubelet on there. And we've done some changes that, that, that will allow that to occur to manage some containers that you may want to manage centrally, that you may not want to manage you know, individually on a device. But at the same point in time, you really don't want to have to do that for every container, right? There's certain things you want to just be isolated on that device and no one can touch. And so we're going to have a mechanism to allow you to go and grab data from that, but not make changes from, an, from a centralized place. Uh, as well as you can go also log on there and then control those particular containers via API locally. So you can have it attached to a centralized cluster if you want. That is the longer term vision. We're still figuring out exactly the details on what's the best way to go ahead and do that. Right, but that's the base foundation for what we've done so far to enable that. Yeah, because I wouldn't say Kubernetes is necessarily a one for one good match from a, from a hierarchy yeah. distributed data structure basis for, for running sure. distributed networks, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, I, I understand why you guys are containerizing what you want to put on here and, and from a pure like switch platform basis. But when you're running at scale, uh, it becomes one of these like self describing headaches that you can get into in terms sure. of. We're also betting on some advancements between now and then, right? Because most folks, <laughs> I mean, in our experience, most folks are, from a network perspective, aren't going like, okay, cool, yeah, I'm going to triple click on Kubernetes, I'm going to double down on it, I'm going to put it everywhere, and I'm going to run an entire network cluster where my entire fabric is made with Kubernetes. That's like great vision stuff, but for now, it's like, let's put Kubernetes on the switch, let's use Kube API, kubectl to control it, and let's build some credibility, build some you know, credibility between the network folks and the, and the DevOps folks to show, hey, you know, we can do things in a cool new way. We're not, you know, stuck in the dark ages anymore. And then as we build out and as Kubernetes advances, because Kubernetes doesn't stay the same between blinks, you know, things advance as well. And, and we're, you know, we're going to be involved in that community as well. We're going to be really leading, you know, how networking is seen in Kubernetes going forward. So that's yeah, kind of the big question too, is that if, you know, if there's this, this fear factor or whatnot, do you think that's sort of a, um, a hurdle that, uh, that you see that's, uh, would slow down adoption on this? Um, it, I don't think so because what we're what we're exposing is a infrastructure that is Kubernetes, right? Um, I will speak Kubernetes and turn the volume up to 15 on anyone who cares. But if I'm talking to a tr traditional network folk that don't really care about Kubernetes, don't want to care, and maybe are scared of it, then I show them the cool stuff I can do with containers and the cool stuff I can do with microservices and the cool you know way that I can do it with a CLI. It's just like other, you know, how other vendors use, you know, a particular type of database as a centralized DB, and then you show the traffic going through that centralized DB and all the forwarding decisions that are made on that. Most network engineers don't care about that. The, you know, the people in this room do because you guys are all smart, right? But the, the 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 average network engineer doesn't really care about, you know, exactly how the infrastructure of the network OS is designed. It's like, what can I do with it? How does it break? What is it? What, what can I get out of it when it breaks? And, and how do I upgrade it? How do I fix it? How do I move forward? How do I configure it? And, and that stuff is happening with Kubernetes, but it doesn't necessarily have to be obvious to them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And so you guys, it's part of the goal is helping to just do initializing fabric build, right? So ZTP, get things up and operational, yep. Yep. make that stuff happen. But from an operator perspective, it's really much more about here's the classic model. BGP runs as a state of state, and we're still good with that, right? Yeah. We're, trying to, we're not trying to change how the control plane is actually operating for the network perspective. For and, and, and I right. don't think that's the, I mean, <laughs> we've, we've all been on that path. Actually, it was kind of an interesting sequitur. I uh, was looking at something at the Computer History Museum the other day about AGSs, and they had a look at the log file, and one of the things they have on there is that, hey, there's this new experimental feature called BGP. We don't know where this will go, but we'll see. <laughs> Things may change. And if you look at the config structure on there, it's almost the same we have today. Right? I mean, so. It's a config guide from <laughs> 1989. And everyone in this room that has one of the, you know, one of the uh, certifications can read that config and go, oh, yeah, yeah, I could configure an AGS. And that's cool, because <laughs> it means that we've spoken the same language for 30 years, but it also means we've spoken the same language for 30 years. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to solve here. Yeah. So. 
Okay, so I'm going to just show you here real quick, uh, you know, starting some, some, you know, actually, you know, in-service upgrades or a hitless upgrade for a particular container. So one of the great things about having things microserviced is that I don't need to sit there and, you know, cross my fingers, you know, put a blessing to the god and hope this ISCU doesn't fail because you have 200 features or 50 features that are all seem to be synchronized and coordinated together. I can now narrow it down to I want to upgrade just this feature. And just that. So the, the testing and the uh, scope of things that go wrong is much smaller, right? So it makes it easier to go ahead and do interactions. And we're doing it in an open way with uh, Kubernetes and stuff like that. The idea here is to give you a CI CD pipeline, right? Let you upgrade on a more regular basis. Sure, Don't keep the network, you know, uh, fragile and brittle so that you're only upgrading it, you know, once every six months, eight months, nine months, 12 months, 18 months, three years. I mean, we used to celebrate when we were in TAC. Wow, we found a device with a 10 year uptime. <laughs> I scared the <laughs> crap out of everybody okay. on the SRE side because yeah. the compute guys go, uh, yeah, that means it hasn't been, uh, you know, security vulnerabilities haven't been updated in 10 years, you know, who knows what CRUD is in the DBs in 10 years. So. All right, cool. So and that outage scenario has not been tested in 10 years. Yeah, no, oh, yeah, <laughs> no yeah. kidding, no kidding. When we were in our previous life, we had to fight, fight to let them uh, have us reboot core routers every, every year. It was like, why would you do that? It's like, well, it only posts certain things on boot. <laughs> like, if you're going to have a line card fail, it's going to happen on boot. Yeah. You want that to happen when you expect it. You've got a dude standing there with another line card. You don't want that to happen, you know, during Christmas rush or wherever, you know, your, your peak sales period is. I don't know if you, can, you guys can see this, but. So I'm going to go actually upgrade adjacent CD. Adjacent CD is actually a mechanism on our system that uh, keeps track of ARP, keeps track of you know, next top adjacencies for routing and forwarding. And I'm going to upgrade that live here, which is traffic running through here from Ixia. Uh, it's behind here. I'll show you in a second. It's, unfortunately, I can't make this much bigger than what it is. But I promise you, that's TX frames, that's RX frames, and that's you know, your, your data or loss for those particular items. And it's sending at about 32 gigs a second, give or take, it looks like. Um, so, and I have a ping running here too, just, just, just kind of running through here just for prosperity cases. So I'm gonna use something that's basically called a deployment. So Kubernetes has a concept of using deployments to actually deploy a particular container. So if we do a kubectl, get deployments, we can see that we have some deployments set up on here. One of them here is CNOS, adjacent CD. And I'm gonna go through the process of actually upgrading this to a different version. So if I first go kubectl and I do describe, uh, Deployment, CN NOS, dash adjacent CD, right? And let's actually grip this down a little bit to image with a capital I. So this is the image I'm running here today. It happens to be one that was built on 2.7 um, of this year. Uh, just a recent release image that we, were, we run through. We run CACD pipelines internally on our stuff to make sure that we can build stuff efficiently and quickly. So we actually cycle through releases quite fast. That's the one advantage of also having, you know, containerized items like this. So I'm going to upgrade it to a different version here. So I have this, you know, just file right here. I'm going to do it to, actually, let me do it to a different version than that. Here two, pair one. Yeah, there we go. I'm gonna upgrade this one from 2.12, okay? So what is that, just a couple days ago? And... He yeah, actually doesn't remember our launch day. <laughs> it was Tuesday. Sure, so let me make sure <laughs> I have the right things I want reference in here. So we're gonna do it for CN NOS. We don't need a dash in there for this particular instance. CN NOS is a deployment that we're... Adam, you're, you're doing here? folder because in every folder you have a different config file that points to different devices. Yeah, I, I actually just, it's not even a Kubernetes file. It's, that's, that's it's actually just my notes for the, the command string that basically you're setting the image for deployment right. and resetting the particular image you want it to go ahead and upgrade to. So uh, in this case, again, it's 2.12.2019.16.59 was when it was built. We just have it stamped with the build date right there. I have just a, a watch basically showing those particular ARP entries that are running on the system today. That's basically the point-to-point -point links and the two 32 and 22 IP addresses for going down to an Ixia. Ixia, you can see their Macs are very creative, 0011, 0012, so. Um, <laughs> and let's go from there. So I'm gonna go ahead and just hit enter here. I have it running up here as well, so you'll see this particular uh, container actually get changed. So I just hit enter right there. It's gonna go ahead and start updating that. If we do... So it's terminating the yep. container. And we can actually get a rolling out update of this status while it's going on. Oops, let me actually change it to the right name. Cool. So now we'll just say waiting for deployment. It's going to roll out there and, and do this upgrade while we're going through here. We have our ping running. Um, I'll push over here. You can see our traffic is sitting there with our Ixia right here. 
So each switch is running a single pod. Yeah. And then you're just managing that resource on the yep. one yep. That's the way it's set up today. That's going to be expanded to something in you know, the future we can do more than that. But right now we're working on a single device. Get the foundation so built. Yeah, so you're, taking, you're eventually going to look at like a leaf spine design and just say this portion of our fabric, yep. single pod. Correct. It's, it's you got fine. it. Oh, and it's finished. Yeah. So successfully rolled out. We could see nothing happen with those particular items. We could see, hey, uh, this guy updated right here. You can see RX and TX, but all the ARP entries are the same. We're all good to go. Ping's still functioning. Traffic's still going. We're running a different version now on that particular device. And, and this, this is that period, right, that delta period. I don't know about anybody else in the room or anybody else watching. This was the period when I would do an ISSU update in the data center when my heart would stop. <laughs> because I'd be looking at all the line cards, all the modules. If it was a fabric extenders, I'd be seeing which ones are going to go offline and which ones aren't going to come back. Adjustments. I'd have 75,000 pings going on so that I could jump on it so my SREs didn't cut my head off when I, when I didn't notice right, right away that a fabric extender didn't come on back online. This, this period of time now, instead of being you know, 12, 15, 16, 17, 18, 20 minutes, is now you know, a couple seconds. You know, what was it, 15, 20 seconds, yeah. not even? If that. So and now you're updating you the new transition state information from the, from the switch into, to keep active state information from mm -hmm. the switch into uh, the, the cube control. Software. Yeah, so we, we use the storage interface very heavily in okay. the, in it, well, in the Kube API. So, so, you're we don't, pull, so you're just pulling it in order to be able to pull. Okay. Correct. There's yeah. only one, one important not, distinction I want to say is that you said from the switch. Remember, the switch is running Kubernetes natively. Sure. So it's, it's from the container that's managing the adjacencies. So all the things are happening local. Yeah. So basically what ends up happening is in the exact process there is as a container comes up, first thing it does, goes and downloads a new container. Once a container is downloaded, it swaps it and goes and runs, and then looks at the state that was previously there, compares the state right now, does it, anything that's changed, and off you go. We can do the same thing in flat, while flopping a port, and it will still function the same way. Because it'll eventually go ahead and reconcile itself for that period of time that it restarts. Is there a scenario where you kind of shoot yourself in the foot doing an upgrade on, let's say, like a routing protocol container, mm -hmm. and maybe your ARP changes or something, and you have this kind of, instead of you reloading the whole switch, you're only reloading a portion of it to where the state looks good on this side, but the container is different. Is there even a scenario where that's that's possible? So. Basically, you're asking if there's a way to roll it back or something like that? No, just like if you were to upgrade, I don't know, like if there's a spanning tree yep. um, container running mm -hmm. and the ARP table looks different than your spanning tree or some way, some way you would mess up the routing table or, or some kind of MAC address tables or something while you're doing a, a container swap. So basically something's happened while it's going on, I guess like a so change occurs? Change occurs <coughs> or anything. So a couple ways of doing that. One, in, in this case with AJSNCD, the time in which the actual container is offline is less than a second. Most of the time you're seeing is it downloading a new container, making sure it's coming up, and then doing the swap. Mm -hmm. The other thing for more complicated changes that we're, that we're going to do, it's not there today, but what we're going to do is basically have another container come up have that stand hate that that state handoff happen and then bring the other container down. Okay. So we don't have to go through that reconciliation. But for most instances, especially with Jason ZD, even at scale, you'd be surprised how quickly it can swap between the two, and you won't actually see the problem with uh, you know something being from that particular perspective. Even if you do happen to miss an ARP, it will ARP again, and you'll pick it right up. From a from a design decision perspective, we've always um, erred on the side of predictability rather than pure hitlessness, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if, because I know when we were running in networks, if, if somebody, if we would tell somebody, hey, you're going to see a 10 second hit, most people were like, yeah, okay, that's fine. We're monitoring. We'll see that it's fine. It's when you tell them, no, no, it's going to be hitless. And we pretty darn sure 98% of the time you're, you're going to be okay, but maybe 2% of the time it'll get off the wires. So if there's ever a design decision between predictability and, 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 and certainty versus we're you know, trying to make it absolutely 100% hitless, we will always choose the predictability choice because it's, that's, we find that that builds credibility between the networking teams and the DevOps teams, the SRE teams, the compute teams, the VPs, everybody. It's just credibility from an operator's perspective is, is super important to us because it's, we know that's what we had to you know, battle when we were running networks. Yeah, and just you know, one other point just to make here is that if you do happen to hit a mistake and go, oh, oh shoot, I messed up. <laughs> I can go ahead and do a, a you know a uh, a rollback or an undo 
of that particular uh, deployment. I'm just doing that really quick. You see the same termination. Nothing will be lost there from ARP or ping standpoint. And you'll just roll back to the previous version you want there. Like, oh man, that broke stuff. Let me go back to where it didn't break stuff. So will I go to you for recommended versions of every app module that I'm supposed to be running? Uh, yeah, so we keep track of, you know, each, each thing's its own swim lane, right? We do recommend having some sort of sequence for some of the items between there, but if you need to go and upgrade one in one direction and one up in the other direction, we have recommended versions for how to go ahead and do that and ways to go ahead and ensure that a customer doesn't get lost in those items. I look us as an extension to a CACD pipeline for customers who want to take that approach. Okay. So. But you build the muscle that it yep. takes to do constant regular changes as opposed to scheduling a maintenance window yep. once every three months. Yep, for sure. And we can see that rollout just, uh, just completed. So. Now, and that's on, this is a device that the upgrade happened. This one is not the one. That's just the other, other side. So let's see here. So really quick, one thing I just want to do really fast is that we talked about being able to remove services on a particular device. So on this device, we have a you know, ton of services on there. You can use Helm to drive and reduce those services that you want running on that device to a smaller subset. So once that Helm chart gets picked up and goes, you'll see a few containers on there that are terminating. Uh, I don't need, you know, STP. I don't need influx on there. I don't want, you know, filter D for ACLs and stuff like that. So you know what? Just remove them off the box. So that answers your question previously about, hey, can a user go ahead and remove things they don't want? Absolutely. So, and they can do the same thing adding. We'll just let those sit there and terminate for a second. So how, how is that reflected in the, so it just starts removing stuff out of the CLI? Mm -hmm. Yep, so basically the CLI will just, you know, as it picks up those, those CRDs being unregistered, yeah. it will go ahead and just remove them from the CLI. It all wraps around basically seeing what the CRD registration looks like. Sure. Yep. If you, you know, are a bad container citizen and don't remove your CRD, guess what? The CLI is not going to be updated. Okay. So. All these services that are running, mm -hmm. are these pulled from other places, open source, or are they, are they things that you've written? I mean, so I'm, I'm trying to associate this with other Linux-based routing projects that are out there, sure. or lin Linux-based network operating systems. Yep. Obviously, we've seen um, a lot of progress there, mm -hmm. things like VRFs and whatever getting built, mm -hmm. the kernel, oh, yeah. those types yep. of things. But there still is not, you know, like you can't look at the feature sets are, are different. So I'd like, how how do you? So are we, these things that you write, or are these like programs that we already understand what the feature sets and and, and things are available? Mix of both. So okay. for BGP, we're using Metaswitch. Right, so MetaSwitch is a very, very, if you've ever heard of them, they're the best unknown name in networking. Yep. So um, they're behind the scenes, a lot of products. Uh, you, you probably don't even realize that they are. And so we're using them for our BGP stack, so you get all the, the feature and functionality you might need from there, everything from whether it be graceful restart or, or you know, four byte ASNs, just from that perspective. Sure. For some of the L2 protocols, spanning tree and stuff like that, we write in house. LTP in right house. Closer to the hardware, it's easier for us to go ahead and do that. Uh, I couldn't really find anyone that was actually a, a decent version of that that was open source, so. Right. And they, they're, you know, not going to say they're easy to write, but it makes sense for us to take that control in that particular perspective. So you guys have taken just the, you know, if I can pull something down that's functional, I'm going to do that. Yeah. Um, is there a listing of what all those things are? Just so that, I mean, because I mean, I'm just trying to understand, you know, like there's we have a, for a point of reference. I'm yep. saying, okay, well, yeah, I understand, you know, the routing is this. We make, yeah, we make that available. For that's, our all, that's all publicly base. available. Yep. Because, yeah, because it's important. Um, when you're running something that's built from open source software, even, even if it's a small percentage or a large percentage, you need to have it really well documented, all the sources of the licenses, because every customer out there has the list of, oh, we don't use that license. Exactly. Uh, so we have it all really documented well in our, in our documentation release notes for customers. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention uh, is, is that we're not married to any particular control plane. Um, we can use any control plane as long as we sandbox it, and that's what we do. So the real long-term you know, vision for us is to be a platform for these different control planes so that you deploy what you think makes sense. Now, it would still come through us, right? Like some version of free-range routing on here, maybe you know, from another you know, vendor, and then, of course, Metaswitch. Everybody has different use cases from price point, from scale, from you know, feature sets and things like that. And, and we really want to give operators the choice to be able to deploy what they need, because that's the whole point to do disaggregation anyway, right. is to say, hey, I want to run this. So we don't want to lock anybody <clears> in <throat> be another you know, skin around the Metaswitch code. Yep. That's so, a good answer, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so so one, one final thing I just want to you know, show you guys on, and obviously feel free to ask me questions as we need to, is I'm going to do an actual uh, insert of upgrade to BGP of the Metaswitch container on there, live while running traffic through here, and just take a see what that looks like. So that you know that, hey, I don't have to do an ISSU and, and do the entire system. I can do it with some infrastructure pieces, like I did with JSON CD. You also can do it with some protocol pieces, let's live in this particular case, um, BGP. So 
We're running this other version from here. It's actually one of the later versions. So I'm actually going to downgrade BGP rather than upgrade BGP. It doesn't really matter in this particular case. It will show what we're, what we're going to, to do here. And I have basically a YAML file that will specify. Uh, I'll do it to the, the 210 version of 210. Particular build. You can see right here. It's running 210, you know, 1756. That's what I'm going to go ahead and upgrade it to. Today we're running, you know, this 212 particular release image on that item. Um, let me actually get a watch running on here for that on there. We don't need this up here anymore. And we could leave it there, but let's just put that off to the side. Oops. I made that full screen. Let's move over this guy over to here. I narrate when I talk, so when I do stuff, so. I apologize for anyone I'm annoying. <laughs> so we used to call them in TAC, we used to call them narrators. The guys and gals that would explain every single line of command on the CLI that they were typing as they went. Okay. So we'll leave that there for now. We'll see, <clears throat> ping. We'll see if we can see that traffic there too. So, um, so I'm going to go ahead and do this. So history, right. of course. And I'm going to upgrade this to 210. Okay, so basically I'm doing a replace that particular item. This one happens to be not a deployment. We're working to get all of our pods to be deployments. This one is just a regular pod, this particular case. Uh, and we're going to go and just do a, a force replace on that particular item. So what it's going to do is force that container to be downloaded and then swapped with uh, what's currently there. And we'll see that up here in this corner over here. We'll see this BGP item right here will be the one that's, that gets swapped. Yeah. device. Okay. All right. So now that's going and doing its thing. Actually, while we're doing this as well, one other thing I'm going to actually show up here is I'm going to do, uh, I don't do this on the byte device itself. Okay. 105.207. Okay. I'm actually going to Do a watch on that. So kubectl get bgp peers. So while you guys are doing that, we had a question come in on Twitter mm -hmm. um, from Kevin Myers. And before the question, he said he's impressed that you guys are running uh, MetaSwitch for BGP. It's a solid protocol stack that's not talked about in North America as much as it should be. But his question was, what overlay or tunnel technologies does the NAS support to deal with some of the challenges that come up in cloud networking when trying to connect within a region or between regions? Okay. It's a great question. Absolutely. So we're uh, so just real quick, just oh. in case anyone's curious, the, that BGP swap is done. That's done. It's yeah, it's the problem swap. when it's so quick is we can't <laughs> answer questions while it's upgrading. <laughs> um, so just to give you an idea, and I was just doing a watch on uh, on BGP here, so you can actually see where that go. You could see the state as was happening. So you can do watches, you know, if you want on a particular object. Like if I wanted to dump everything from BGP, any changes that happen, I'm going to get an update on that. And I was just doing that with, you know, looking at those particular items there. Uh, so you can see if anything changes from that state of status we're doing it. We're using graceful restart in this case. We saw it go from established, active to reestablished. And that's with the XES, so it functions as we expect. Traffic flows, nothing's dropped. The world is a beautiful place. Back to the question. Yeah, so <laughs> we're, we're adding uh, VXLAN here shortly in the next release uh, mm -hmm. coming out uh, within the next uh, couple months. The, the thing with uh, that is going to be internal data center for use cases where you'd want to use it for MLAG, but we want people to stay away from MLAG as much as possible <laughs> because we have a lot of battle scars uh, with MLAG and you know v VPC and all that. So uh, we will have a, a VXLAN support, but for tunneling to clouds and all that, that's, that's not something that's within the, the use cases that we're looking at initially. We're mostly focused on you know, top of rack and spine leaf. Um, but if you're interested, reach out, and like I said before, we, we build based on demand, right? So we really, really want to tailor the network OS and our feature set in a way that's for the people that we're making it for. I mean, it's the, this is the whole point of CI, CD, and microservices and containerization, right? Is mm -hmm. to be able to in, implement and, and integrate and continuously improve, right? And we do. We always talk about it in the office. It's like, oh, what's the version of that doc? Or, hey, is that the latest? Well, it's CI CD, right? So I'll just give you a new PowerPoint slide you know, this morning. So it's, it's CI CD is a mindset, right? Not just, not just something that we say, uh, continuously improving and continuously deploying. Yep. We like deploying, by the way, we're delivering. 
So, so just one, one other thing, just a quick note. We were talking about this being monitored before. I don't know if anyone remembers. This could be a, a quiz exercise of which, which route before was actually true to being the best path in BGP. I believe it was this guy over here, this 10.004 next top. Well, now it's moved over up to 10.00 when we did that swap because the age of the routes changed. So this is a real live update of what's actually happening on those particular items. So you actually can manage and monitor your NRLRIs. The advantage I see that for an operator is if I'm getting routes from an external provider, especially if I have a clause, and I have like a default route that if that route goes away, a lot of things fail or a set of aggregated routes I'm receiving, I now can go ahead and actually look to see if that particular NLRI from that particular provider is available or not. Or if it changes. Something happens, hey, look, the AS path is now over here. I actually can react to that. Uh, I mean, there'd be a 30 second, you know, lag from when it actually gets monitored and displayed. But how many times you've been called up, everything broke, we don't know, it takes people two hours to figure out we're not receiving a prefix from a particular location. If that prefix is important, now I can actually monitor a particular one and actually see what's going on there. And that's just one aspect of what you could do with the idea of being able to monitor any object or any state object in the system. You could do it with a route, you could do it with active routes, you could do stuff going into the FIB. In this case, it's just showing it with a, the PHP NLRI. Yeah. So if I wanted to learn this, are you guys on NRE Labs or do you have a VM <laughs> image that we can download? Um, to kind of play around with the system that's maybe not like an active production network or anything, or actual physical equipment? So, so right now it has to run on Whitebox hardware. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so the, your barrier to entry is a, one of the platforms that we support on Edge for today. Uh, so just reach out. Those are pretty readily available and, and not terribly uh, too hard to get started with. Um, we probably will have something like that, you know, in the not too distant future. Yeah. Um, but we really do require hardware at this particular moment because yeah. we're really, really keened in on, on performance and, and, you know, the speed and the ease of having everything on hardware. Yeah, that's what we see kind of advantage of. Now, we're not GNS3 as well. We're, that's something that we're, your labs or something. We're, we're investigating that was actually saw with partnering some people. I can't get into details of what that looks like yet, um, but there's going to be some mechanisms that make it easier for people to consume. Uh, from that particular perspective. But there is, a, there is a vision to look at making this into a virtualized system as well because the platform you know, behooves itself to easily be portable. So yes, we run Yocto. The containers don't have to run on our system. They can run wherever. So. Thank you. Yeah.